uh, <clears throat> want to show you a video uh, in just a moment. I forgot to mention last Sunday we had uh, 756 people here in our three services. And we praise the Lord for the great outreach on Easter and a lot of new families. Many of them have come back. So thank you if you're one of them that came back for our normal services on uh uh, on a Sunday, so we're glad that you're here. And for you that are visiting, it's always a privilege to have folks come and an honor to have you come and be with us uh, to worship our King together. We, um, um, I have been saying this for some time, we are, we are closer to the end than you might believe. And uh, I have a lot of respect for certain prophetic teachers in America, and one of them is Jack Hibbs. And he is well informed, and he does not speak uh, just to hype things up, but he is trying to warn people. So listen very carefully, because this starts right away with him speaking uh, about something that's taking place, a two-minute clip. So uh, watch this. So right now as I speak to you, uh, there's no doubt about it, Israel is at war. It's pretty much official. They've been uh, warring. Uh, over these last uh, six days, pretty intense going on. Iran is manipulating Syria. Russia and China are manipulating Iran. They together are now manipulating Saudi Arabia. That has infected South America and Venezuela. It's also brought in North Korea. The target, Israel and the United States. To take down the United States, you don't have to shoot one bullet to take down the United States. You don't have to drop one bomb. All you have to do is tamper with our fragile economy. That's already happening. Israel is now fighting a multi-front war regarding a multiple of nations. According to the Bible, what we should see soon is some sort of massive, massive explosion, some sort of contamination of, fallout in the city of Damascus based on Isaiah chapter 17. That should happen at any time. Uh, Ezekiel 37 and 38 should happen at any time. The players of those nations that are in Ezekiel 38 are there right now. And so no wonder why people who don't know the scriptures are in fear. They're looking at the third world war. Yes, we are. I think we're in it right now. But what is it going to escalate to? Will it go to the level of what is known as the Ezekiel battle? It's possible. Here's the thing that should get your attention. Great Bible scholars, they don't know where to place the Ezekiel 38 battle. Is it right before the rapture? Or is it right after the rapture? That's where the scholars disagree. The point is this, who cares? They're talking about it just before the rapture or just after, and all of the players are assembling now in Israel in the surrounding areas. How close are we? Let's go. Are you ready? Put your faith in Christ. Be looking up. Make sure your sins have been covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so things are happening um, quicker than we know, and... That is one of the signs. It was just uh, in Fox News uh, yesterday or today I saw it. China has just gone to Germany to try to get their support for their intended invasion of Taiwan. Taiwan is an independent nation. They don't want anything to do with China. And China is going to invade that country. So we are right at the edge our, our economic um, stability is more fragile than you understand. I've told you in the past, you better stop spending money frivolously and just going through your cash. You better have cash on hand. Cash will be king when the market falls and everybody runs to the supermarkets and there's no food within just hours. You better have cash and you better have some food. So I, uh, I want you to know that I don't want to be guilty of not warning you of what's going to take place in America. And uh, we are going to face some hard times, I believe, 
in the days ahead. So let's prepare our hearts and uh, we can trust the word of God. The Bible describes the times that we're living in and we know the scriptures are true and today Dr. Horton is going to give you more evidence that Jesus is who he said he was and the word of God is exactly what we believe it to be, the inspired word of God. So would you give him a good welcome as he comes. Let's um, begin our time together in prayer. Lord, as we're about to study your word, the validity of it, I pray that the scriptures would well up in our hearts and we see what it is that sometimes we just take for granted. And we give you the glory, our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> How many have heard of the SETI project? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's been, a, been ongoing, billions of dollars, many of it from private um, sources, have been used to develop this project, and they're out there listening for information to see if we can make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And from their website, they, see, they give us their mission. The mission of the SETI Institute is to explore, understand, and explain the what? Origin and nature of life. Isn't that interesting? It, what it tells us there is that whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, this is important how we got here and what life is all about. Everybody is interested in that, okay? And, and the origin of the universe and the evolution of intelligence. How did this all happen? And of course, it's based upon the concept of evolution. <clears throat> and if we evolved into uh, life here by accident, then elsewhere in the universe that might have happened also, well, also. But there are also some thoughts that maybe somewhere out there in the universe is the ultimate intelligent one that seeded life onto this planet. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> well, this is an uh, actual quote from the Internet a while back. And it turns out to be not true, but it's interesting to look at. Yesterday, the Internet lost its mind. Well, that happens all the time. <laughs> over the news that Russia astronomers had detected a spike in radio signals, apparently from the vicinity of a star-like, or sun-like star known as HD whatever. The star is just 94 light years away and is known to have one Neptune-like planet, and there may be others. The media quickly speculated about aliens. Not a drill! SETI is investigating a possible extraterrestrial signal from deep space. Now stop there. Why the excitement? We got contact with intelligence from outside our planet. Wow! If the signal is truly from an alien world, it is one that's far more advanced than ours. How do we know that? Uh, maybe because they could at least talk to us. I don't know. And of course, Twitter and everybody else runs wild with the news. All right. That didn't happen, by the way. It turned out to be nothing. <clears throat> Surprise. And, but what if? What if it turned out to be true? We received a message from highly intelligent life outside of this planet. Question for you is, how would you react? I mean, that would be significant. And what would we want to know? Well, we'd want to know, first off, <coughs> excuse me, is this message trustworthy, right? Because you, can, oh, you don't know the people at the SETI Institute. Maybe somebody faked the message. That's never happened before, right? Human beings can do that kind of thing to be, kind of make themselves big or get very excited. So is the message legitimate? And then the value of the message really depends on who it's from. In other words, if you think about it in a court setting, <clears throat> the value of a witness is based upon that person's credibility, a drug dealer versus an upstanding citizen in the community. Big difference. So who is this from? And, and you think about it, all human testimony has a certain limited value. And then we would want to know, well then, will it tell us who we are? How did life begin on earth? 
And what is our purpose of life? And then if this being is that intelligent, could it tell us what the future holds? That would be valuable if he's that smart or he, she, or whatever it is. And so that would be interesting. Well, now let's compare that to the Bible as a message from outside the universe. Because that's what it claims to be. A message from outside the, uh, our earth and actually outside the universe. From the creator of the universe who's outside space and time. If that's true, now put that in comparison now, that would change everything, wouldn't it? That would make all the difference in the world. So the first thing we have to ask is, is it trustworthy? Is it trustworthy? So how do we figure this out? How do we find out if the Bible is trustworthy? First thing we'd want to do, probably, and there are different methods you could use, but I'd want to see, well, what does the message claim about itself? What does it say about itself first, and then let's see if it can live up to that claim. So, so let's take a look in the, in the Bible itself, <clears throat> and we go to 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, so now it's defining the Bible, what it is, is breathed out by God. Because it's breathed out by God, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. In other words, the character of it, it has a value based upon where it came from. Now, where did it come from? It says it's breathed out. That's a, a Greek word, theanoustos. And um, um, let me say that slower. Thea, we get the word theology from the Greek word theos, which is God. All right? So, God, and then it's noustos. How many have ever used a uh, pneumatic tool? Anybody use? Go yeah. Take wheels off, tires off. What are they? Air driven. That's a noustos tool. A wind, air driven tool. So what this text is saying, this is literally the breath of God who spoke to us. And that's what makes it profitable. That's what makes it profitable. Now, if that's true, the value is, uh, there's no, no value you could put on it. It's too high. This would literally be the best instruction for all humanity. Therefore, the Bible claims to be the actual thoughts of the creator of the universe for us. Whoa. I mean, there are days where you kind of go, oh, read the Bible again today. But let it set in. Wow, what is it we are reading? And sometimes there are texts that are hard. Well, would you expect it all be easy if it's from the creator of the universe? All right, so there's a lot that we have to figure out and get understood. But if this is what it is, that would be valuable. You know, each of us are born under this earth, and at various times in our life we become kind of become aware of first ourselves and then everybody else around us. I remember when I was about five, I became aware that I existed, and I actually thought this, I can still remember this, which is really weird, but I remember thinking, Does, is everybody else real, or is this kind of like uh, the Matrix kind of thing, and they're all about you know, here, and they're fake, and I'm real. I, I didn't know. And later I came to realize, no, wait a minute, everybody is experiencing life like this. So then we look to older people to, to lead us, and then you suddenly find yourself an older person, you go... This is it? <laughs> this is as smart as we get? Whoa! How do we make it this far? You know, so where do we find truth? And if the Bible is what it says it is, that's our source to figure out this life. Okay, but wait a minute. <clears throat> that sounds good, but did men write the Bible? I mean, you've heard that, right? People wrote the Bible, and that's true. Men wrote it down, so... Huh. Well, let's look over in Peter and see if we can help put that together, because Peter addresses this. And he says, knowing this first of all, first thing, get this right, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now, many of you read that and went, what does that mean? Well, it's not, not that person's ideas. In other words, it's saying, no prophecy in the Bible is written because this guy had some ideas and wanted to pass them on to you, like a good book or a letter. It's not that at all. And he goes on to say this, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. 
So we're talking about the Bible here. None of the Bible's prophecies are by men, but men spoke from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. God then put words into the mouths of the prophets to write down those thoughts that he intended to communicate to us. <clears throat> now at this juncture, I usually teach people two important words. One is the word revelation. How many of you have ever said, well, yeah, I was reading the Bible then, God revealed to me this. You ever said that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's not the, what I'm talking about here. That's kind of like he illuminated, really. He kind of showed something to us. But revelation, in a biblical sense, is where, where God's Spirit comes upon the prophet and he literally puts the words that he wants into that prophet's mind. The concepts, if you were better, the concepts. Puts into him the concepts of it. And then the prophet writes it down in words exact with his personality exactly as God intended. All right, and that's called inspiration. So the text now is inspired. It's inspired. That makes it trustworthy. The resultant text of a revelation to a prophet is a text that's inspired by the Spirit of God. If that's true, then we can understand why when we read the book of John, it writes, he writes differently than Paul. Paul is a real logical thinker. John is a real feeler, if you will. It's all about a lot of feeling. And then Peter's somewhere in between, and you can tell their writings. Their writings. And so theologians have thought about this, and I'm going to give you a, um, a um, theological definition of inspiration by Dr. Robert Cook in one of my earlier courses in theology from uh, Western um, Seminary, Western um, Conservative Baptist. He said, oh, whoops, sorry, I got ahead of myself. What is this? Oh, did I go the wrong way? Oh, man, I did. I missed a whole bunch. All right. So let's go back. Uh, let's see. We did follow the eyewitness for, oh, yes, my goodness. How did I miss all this? All right. So Peter says this. He said, we can know this to be true. Oh, I know what happened. I missed a page. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, whoever's filming this, cut this little section out right there. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's really interesting. All right. All right. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. Um, I missed that completely. All right. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. This is earlier on. Um, that's why I was messed up. Uh, when we made, um, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter is saying this. He said, we saw the majesty of Christ, and that's how we know it's true. Now, what's he speaking of there? This is the event called the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember that story? Uh, Peter, James, and John are taken up on a higher mountain, a little bit higher up on the mountain, probably in northern Israel, and they're there by, with Jesus by himself. And, uh, and, and they kind of fade off. It's been a long hike. It's a long ways up there. They fade off and wake up, and then all of a sudden there's Jesus glowing, like nothing you've ever seen before. And there is Moses and Elijah. Now, how would you like that? Wouldn't that be cool to suddenly say, and they knew it was them somehow. That's Moses. Man, I've been wanting to meet you. You know, how was that walking through that sea? You know, all sorts of things you might ask. And then, then Elijah there, the great prophet. And as they're chattering with Jesus, and these guys didn't dare do that, by the way. They're sitting there watching this whole thing. A cloud starts moving in. And, and there was something about that cloud, I suspect, that made them kind of go, oh. And then out of the cloud, we, we hear a voice. So Peter continues on in verse 17. He says this, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, that cloud's coming, and out of the voice suddenly, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the vo the, this voice, very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So he heard that. And so that then has a result. And we have the prophetic word 
more fully confirmed to which you what? Do well to pay attention to. You do well to pay attention to it. And, and, and as we put this in perspective, stop right there, if we put this into perspective, isn't that true? If this is what it claims to be from God, the creator of the universe, the gives us the knowledge that we've all wanted. Every human being on earth wants to know, why are we here? How did we get here? This one gives us that affirmation. Shouldn't we pay a little attention to it? Or should we just dust it off once in a while? Every Christmas and Easter, we dust it off. Why? Because it's like a lamp shining in a dark place. It explains so much. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And that's kind of looking forward to the very end of things when we're with Christ ourselves. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes by someone's own interpretation. Now we get back to that. For the prophecy was produced not by the will of man, but when men spoke as God were, uh, from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's Interpret. That's how the prophet comes about that revelation. And then he speaks those words and gives us the inspired text. Inspired text. One of the greatest privileges I've ever had in my life came after I finally walked away from veterinary practice, which was not easy for me to do. Um, I spent a lot of time. I enjoyed working with animals and, and animal people. And there came a day in the, I was driving down the road and, and I just was struggling because of all the the issues I had with being a pastor and a veterinarian, and I was heading out to a ranch to work some cows, and I, I was struggling because I just got a message from one of my pharmaceutical companies that my, the bills are overdue. And the reason the bills were overdue is because I didn't have any money. And the reason I didn't have any money is because I haven't taken time to bill my dairy clients, because I was only doing dairy at the time, three dairies, and if I bill them, they pay the next day. They're fast. They pay right on time. But I haven't done it. And I was struggling, because why didn't I do that? Because I'm planting a church. And so I'm just trying to work through time, and I felt like the psalmist, <clears throat> David. What are you doing, Lord? I'm trying to do what you want me to do. And I, I can tell you, this only happened about five times in my life. But this one time, I, I was struggling with God, and I didn't hear a voice. I knew the answer. It literally came in a question. And it, said, and it was God just said, well, which are you, Kevin? Are you a pastor or are you a veterinarian? Now, that was a good question. Because um, how many of you think highly of your veterinarian? All right. Keep your hands up. How many of those same people think just as highly of your physician? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm doing that somewhat facetiously. But the point is this. Everybody loves the vet because he loves their animals and all that. Right? And... There's a prestige. Now, think of the world. How highly do they think of pastors? Uh, maybe some of you do, because you're, you're believers, but how about the world out there? They don't think much of us at all. And I was struggling with that prestige change. And it was that day, I think God called me on the carpet. My wife had called me on the carpet earlier because she said, Kevin, every time you introduce yourself and people ask, what do you do? And what, how do you answer that? And I said, well, I'm a veterinarian oh, and a pastor and a, and a pastor. <laughs> you know, and, and it's so interesting to watch their faces, too. Oh, you're vet. Oh, you're pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and I could feel that and perceive that. But when I finally made that decision, I made it that day. I, God has called me to be a pastor. I left the veterinary practice and and got my bills paid. <laughs> but um, the big thing was, is now I had more time. And God opened the door for me to go to seminary. And that's the whole point of this thing. Is going to seminary was the greatest gift that God ever gave me. Because I finally got an understanding of how his word synthesizes together. And what a gift that is. And that's why you must be in a Bible teaching church with a pastor who's been trained and can help you work through these issues. And it is valuable. It is really valuable. Because you do well to pay attention to the words of the scriptures. You do well to pay attention. Well, this is the, um, 
the definition I was going to give you of inspiration, that God so directed the authors of the Scripture. This is by Dr. Robert Cook, a Western conservative Baptist seminary. And, and he said, God so directed the human authors of Scriptures that without destroying their individuality, personal interest, or literary style, notice that, you can pick up the style of the writer. His complete thought towards man was recorded without error in, in the words of the original writings. And so your study is of the words, because then words have meaning. And that's why I think the, the, the whole concept of words and pronouns and all things are in attack, because words are critical, and the order of words are critical. And that's what we have in the Scriptures, is we have God's words recorded for us. No error. No error. So, all right, that's fine. That's what it says it is. And I could say, how many of you believe that? And I hope you'd all put your hand up because you're at church. And then, then I don't know if you were the only person maybe in a large community setting and somebody says, how many of you really believe the Bible is God's Word? That's a little harder to put your hand up unless you're really convicted. So how do we know that it is what it says it is? That's the question that we really want to address today. Excuse me a minute. I'm going to shut this off. Um, I reminded of one day in seminary, in preaching class, and the, the, uh, the uh, um, professor says, okay, guys, we've got to work on a few things while you're up front. You know, and my big problem was is I'd stand there in the pulpit like this, and, and he said, you look like you're going to throw that at us. You know, so that was one. And, the, and then, the, then one of the things he taught us is, all right, every once in a while you're going to get teary or you have a little bit of a cold. I'm on the back end of a cold. And he says, you're going to have to blow your nose. All right, so how do you do that? And so he literally trained us how to do that. Turn off the mic, turn around, blow your nose, wipe your nose, come back. Okay, so there we are. <laughs> That's a trained pastor there, right there. Okay. All right. Now, how can we know that the Scriptures really are what they claim to be? We, we see that it claims to be literally inspired by the creator of the universe, telling us about life and where we came from and who we are. All right, so how can we know that's true? Well, if it is truly what it says it is, it should be able to tell us about things that are going to happen before they happen. It should tell us very specific things that we need to know. And so that would be called the area of prophecy, and that kind of is what Jack Hibbs was talking about in his little section there. We're going to take that a little further. And we're going to start out with one of the um, <clears throat> most important prophecies of the whole Bible, and that is the son of the woman prophecy. How many know what I'm talking about? A few. Well, let me help you explain. This is one of the most important because this is the Messiah. He is the son of a woman, not a man but son of a woman. And it begins in Genesis chapter 3 after Adam and Eve sin. And there were literally just one Adam and one Eve, just two of them. Um, we'll, we won't go on a rabbit trail on that, but that is literally true. And, in, in, and by the way, what the Bible is going to do in this prophecy is it's going to give us an address for the Messiah. All right? Now, this is... Uh, the uh, Institute for Biblical Authority. And if you wanted to find it in, in Hamilton, well, you just look for our great big building um, on Main Street there. All right, it's maybe not real big. Um, and, and, but how do you find it? Well, we use the address, right? And we start out with, it's in the United States of America. Now, what does that do right there? It eliminates all the other nations of the world. So you don't have to go look for me in Afghanistan or, or in Europe or anything like that. I'm in the United States of America. And in the United States, I'm in one state, the state of Montana. So that eliminates 49 other states. And not only that, but I'm in the little town of Hamilton, Montana. And that eliminates all the towns in Montana. And I'm on Main Street. So that eliminates all the other streets in Hamilton, Montana. And I'm at 127 Main Street, 
which eliminates all the other buildings on Main Street in Hamilton, Montana, USA. And then I'm in Suite 6, this monstrous big 600-square-foot room. That's my office. <clears throat> That's the only place that has that exact address, so you can find me. The Bible does the same thing with the Messiah. Gives us his address so we can find him and identify him as the Messiah. And so the first prophecy of the coming Messiah, I call it the son of the woman prophecy. Somebody said, I've never found anybody else call it that. I named it. Of course he didn't, because I named it. Well, it's because that is what it is. Okay, so I've named it that way. Others will say this is the first uh, Messianic prophecy in the Bible. It is. It's speaking of the Messiah. Right after Adam and Eve's sin, God confronts all the actors. He confronts Adam, he comes to Eve, and he confronts Satan. And this section, he's confronting Satan. And he says, I will put strife, enmity, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Those words are plural. Then, notice, and pronouns are important, okay? He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Singular. There's one coming Messiah, and he is going to be the son of the woman. <clears throat> now, if you take the Bible, the Old Testament as a whole, there are 60 major prophecies um, with 270 ramifications that give the exact address of the son of the woman, effectively eliminating all other possibilities. Okay? So that's what we have here. And so what's strange about this one is the prophecy states that the coming son is her offspring, not Adam's. I mean, comes from Adam. But this particular one is speaking of the, the mother. And in those cultures, rarely speaks of a son relative to his mom. Almost always speaks to the son relative to the father. Interesting observation. Now, what is this depicting? The flood of Noah. And I use this picture because um, I think it's kind of cute and artistic. Uh, my staff and my... Uh, my board really hate this picture. Why? Well, because the ark is like way out of proportion in size, way too small, right? It's, it's a big ship, 600-foot-long ship, uh, 500. And then the second thing, birds are flying. Where are the birds going to land? They're all dead. They're drowned. So that, that's really ridiculous. But, all right, let's deal with Noah. If you think about the coming son of the woman <clears throat> and the flood of Noah was a real event, then Noah is the father of all humanity on earth. Okay? So we start with Noah. That's all the people on the earth. Who does the Messiah come from, according to the Scriptures? comes from Shem. Shem. Now, we're Japhethites, most of us here. We're Europeans. All right? And that would be called the Gentiles in New Testament times. Ham Hamitic people are African and East Asia people. And the Shemites is where it's going to come from. So basically, from Noah on, we've eliminated two-thirds of the population as being possible candidates for the Messiah. All right? Then we get to Genesis 12, and God calls Abraham, and that eliminates all the rest of the people of the world. They're all, none of them are possible. And then Abraham, we calls Isaac, which eliminates Ishmael. So any tribes of Ishmael are eliminated, and Jacob then it's not Esau, so that eliminates all of his children. And so we're zeroing in on the line of the Messiah. And now Jacob, who was renamed Israel, uh, he has a little battle with God, and Israel means strives with God. Um, he had a particular son who would be the line of the Messiah. Who is that? It's Judah. It's Judah. Lion of Judah. You might have heard that song. All right. And then Isaiah, interesting, after this, or let's see, yeah, this would be after this. Isaiah, about 700 years before the Messiah is born, we get this prophecy from Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin shall conceive. That's an oxymoron. All right, how does a virgin conceive without a father? Interesting, interesting. <clears throat> Remember that? The son of the woman is speaking of 
this is a son of the woman <clears throat> and not of a father. That's interesting. So then we get down to Jesse, and he has eight sons, and David is chosen, eliminating those other seven. So the Messiah has to be a son of David. So how many of you can trace your lineage back to David? All right, so what that means is none of you are the Messiah. Just we'll get that out of your brain, all right? I know your wife thought you were, but it's not true, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know she didn't. <laughs> all right, so they're out of there. See, all the rest of earth have been eliminated. And there are, this is just a few of the prophecies. And it goes on, and, and then in Micah, it tells us another little address, that he will be born in what town? Bethlehem. So if the Messiah, was, if somebody claims to be Messiah and they're born in Jerusalem. No, nope. had to be born in Bethlehem. That's a town, a little town. That's, that's Hamilton size. All right, that eliminates a lot of people. But not only that, but look at this. From you shall come forth for me one who will be ruler of Israel. That's the Messiah whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. What does that mean? Implication. This is not a normal person. This is somebody from before time. Very interesting. You read the Bethlehem part, you miss that sometimes. So, the son of the woman must be born in Bethlehem, eliminating all other birthplaces in the entire world. Okay? So, here's the point. We've only had a few of these prophecies. No one, no one in all of history, except Jesus, meets the prophetic requirements to be the son of the woman. That is astonishing. That is astonishing to think through. Astonishing to let that get... How in the world did that happen? How did we get this? <clears throat> See, we've only examined a few of the 60 prophecies with 270 ramifications that identify the exact person of the Messiah. And Jesus fits them all. That's astonishing. Even his birth place being in, in Bethlehem was somewhat miraculous because it required the census at that time. And the girl had to come there. And uh, all, all those different things that happened there. But I want to then, that's one thing. That's enough, isn't it? Right there is enough information to say, whoa, the Bible does authenticate itself. Well, let's take it one step further and let's blow your mind in detail. And don't get bogged down in detail. Get the concept. All right? And it's in Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse 20 to 27. Now, Daniel wrote from exile in Babylon. So let's get the context. Daniel is part of the people that lived about 600 B.C. in Israel. For 300 years, God's been sending prophets to Israel, warning them, if they don't change their ways, they're going to go into exile. And the nation of Israel, it's split into two nations, Israel and Judah. The nation of Israel is gone already. And now we just have Judah around Jerusalem, left. And they start messing up real bad, and God sends prophets. So you read all the prophets, and you read the prophets, and they're all angry. Well, that's why, because they're doing things terrible. All right? I think God could send us a few prophets right now. And so they're doing things wrong. God's going to send them to exile, and then he does during Daniel's day. And Daniel is probably a young teen, maybe 12 years old, when he goes into exile in Babylon. He spends his life there and dies there. All right? He's been there 69 years now. So do the math. If he was 12, um, this guy's getting up there in age. He's in 80. Okay, he's, he's 80, um, 81, something like that. And, and by the way, there was a contemporary prophet. At the same time, Daniel's a prophet, but before him, living while he was alive, was the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah predicts the coming destruction of Jerusalem before Daniel's taken, and then he talks about it. And so Daniel receives the book of Jeremiah and starts reading through it, because it's a new book, and he realizes the exile is prophesied to end after 70 years. Well, wait a minute, how long has he been there? 69 years. Whoa! 
Whoa! So what does Daniel do? Uh, well, in that, by the way, this was written before Daniel, uh, uh, but right, at, right contemporary with him, and while he was in Babylon. And this was written just before Bab- um, Israel uh, falls, or, or sorry, not Israel, Judah. And, and so Dan- Jeremiah is saying this. He says this, This whole land shall become a ruin and waste. Well, Daniel lived through that. And right now, Jerusalem's totally destroyed when Daniel's there. He's in Babylon, uh, 900 miles away. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How long? You know, have you ever read the Bible and something that you've read thousands of times jumps out? Well, Daniel's been there a while. Now, I don't know if he read it before, but when he saw that, he said, wait a minute. That's like next year. Whoa. He says, 70 years. He reads on. Then after the 70 years are complete, oops, sorry, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares Yahweh, making the land an everlasting waste. So he's saying, Babylon's going to get destroyed. <clears throat> and Daniel's in Babylon. Whoa, whoa, this is something. And so what did he do? He prayed and fasted. First thing he did, he got on his knees and prayed. And, and then you think about it. They are in Babylon because of their iniquities. So the next thing he does is confess his sin and the sin of his people. So that's, that led to the exile. Uh, so their sins. And, and so while he's praying, he gets a visit. This is a prophet. These things happen to prophets' lives. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before Yahweh my God, for the holy hill of my God, that's Jerusalem and that's the Temple Mount, I'm praying for that because that's, where, that's our identity with God. That's where He came to our nation. That's where uh, we uh, worshipped Him. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who's he? That's an angel, right? We know that from, from when this is fulfilled, too. Gabriel comes to him, and that's an angel. Notice how Daniel sees him as a man. Whom I had seen in the vision at first, so he'd already seen this guy once before, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening fl- uh, sacrifice. I just love that description, don't you? Here's an angel who comes to him. How does he get there? Swift flight. Wow, that just, I mean, that lets my mind go all sorts of places. And he made me understand, speaking to me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your plea for a mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you. Stop there. He started to pray, and a decree happened from the throne of God. Gabriel, come here. Take this to Daniel. Wow. And look on. For what? You, Daniel, are greatly loved. I love, uh, uh, I think it's the NASB says, you are highly esteemed. What would it be like to be somebody who God says, I highly esteem that person. Wow. By the way, it's because he was faithful through his life. You're faithful to the Lord. You are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. I'm going to tell you what you've been asking about. What's he asking about? What's going to happen to the nation? It's been 70, 69 years. When is this going to happen? What's, it going, what's going to go? What's going to go on? And here it is. Seventy weeks are decree, decreed for your, about your people. Stop there. Seventy weeks. That's really strange. The word isn't weeks. In Hebrew, it's sevens. So, but it's kind of nice because it kind of compacts it. So you think of a week as a week of years or a seven-year package. So there's 70 of these seven-year weeks. All right? So it'll be seven times 70, 490 years that this is speaking and addressing. Okay? And who is it addressing for? Who is it about? Your people, Daniel. Who is his people? Jewish people. So this is for the Jewish people, okay? Your holy city, what is that? Jerusalem. To finish what? Transgression. To put an end to sin. Well, when's that going to happen? Well, that's the very end. 
to atone for iniquity. When did that happen? The cross. He says this, Now therefore, know therefore, and understand, from the going out of the Word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Wait, stop there. There's a starting point. The clock. Whenever there's a prophecy, somewhere future you, Daniel, there's going to be a prophecy for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's when the clock starts. Okay? Got that? And, and, and then, uh, so from the, the, let's see, did that, uh, to restore, rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one. Whoa! That's the son of the woman, the Messiah, when he comes. All right, so this is a clock telling us when the Messiah will come. A prince, there shall be seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. Oh, it's, it's 49 years from then. Oh, wait, no. And then 62 weeks. So 62 times seven. That's kind of interesting math. It shall be built again with squares and a moat in a time of trouble. So this is saying there will be a 49 years of rebuilding, and then there's going to be lots of trouble. And we know that from history. <clears throat> After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be what? Cut off. What is that a prophecy of? We know it now. The cross. The Messiah comes, and then He's cut off, right? Just like He barely gets there. Shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. That actually happened now, AD 70. So we know that's done. And it shall come with a flood, and the end shall be declared, and desolations are decreed. In other words, bad things are going to happen after that. Okay? Now, let's put this together and see if we can wrap our heads around it a little bit. All right. We know, by the way, when there was a decree for the rebuilding of the temple. And it was a decree by a guy by the name Artaxerxes of Persia. And it was to Nehemiah. And we know the date of that. We can get it pretty accurate through the the records, and know when that was. There it is. That means nothing to me other than it was somewhere in 444 B.C. I can get that part. And, and, and here's an interesting thing, is we, we can come to a pretty precise date of the, of the death of Christ based upon that it was on the Passover. All right, so that really brings us to a very important date. And, and right about that time, whenever this crucifixion, that's the anointed one being cut off. Now, also, I'm just going to throw out here, there's still another seven-year period for the Jewish people. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> All right. So, we actually can put in these dates using our time frame. This is not the same calendar as the prophets use, so we're going to have to fiddle with that. But these are the dates that we actually know that this is when the Messiah was cut off, and this is when that decree went back, so we could actually figure out the day. We could do the math, all right? And so we're, the Jewish calendar, prophetic calendar, works on a 360-day uh, year, 12 months of 30 days. That's just the way they did their prophecies, which adds to great confusion for us here. So we're going to have to convert. And I'm just going to go through it. I'm not going to do the math for you. But da-da-da-da-da-da. And, and so we come to uh, back up just a touch. If we come to here and we do the math on our Gregorian calendar, we come to this for the number of years, but it isn't exact, so we're going to have to adjust to the Jewish calendar of days to get the exact day. And that adds 25 days to what this comes out to, and it actually comes out to this date of March 30th, A.D. 33, is when the Messiah should come. Anybody recognize that day? Well, all right. That is the day, by the way. Historical records give us the date of Jesus' arrival to Jerusalem as the king came in on the donkey. Peaceful. And that was March 30th, A.D. 33. That is the exact date that Daniel prophesied would happen and Daniel prophesied that 500 plus years before Jesus set foot on this earth. And it gives us the date he would arrive on the donkey. Not the day of his crucifixion, but the day he would arrive on the donkey because that's when he comes as the king. It's four days later he was crucified, rejected by the nation, and so that was when he was cut 
off. And you see, we have a message from beyond earth that is unbelievable. 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 Now, do you remember from that chart of Daniel's? There was one more seven-year period. Who was this prophecy for? A group of people. Who were they? The Jewish people. The sons of Israel. All right? So the last one week or last seven-year period that has not yet come, after the Messiah is cut off, then there's this gap. And Israel was, the nation of Israel was destroyed. Um, the city of Jerusalem was totally destroyed. And everybody looked at us and said, well, that's the end of Israel. Then Isaiah says, 700 years before the Messiah comes and 2,700 years before now, and says, can a nation be built in a day? Can a nation come into existence a day? And prophesizes that Jerusalem will be, or Israel will be established in a day. When was that? 1948. In a day. A day. And there's still a seven-year period for those people of the Jewish faith. <clears throat> and you see, it is because this is for the Jewish people is why I'm convinced that the rapture is for the church to be removed and the Jewish people now are going to prepare the way for their Messiah to come back. And that's why I'm convinced the rapture, this is the one scripture because the seven years, the tribulation period is for them. It is not for the church. Along with all the things about Revelation, talks about the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And then chapter 4, John's taken up and never mentions the church again. It's all Jew Jerusalem and Israel. That period of time is for the Jewish people. And we are nearing that greatly fast. Greatly fast. You can trust the words of the Scriptures. The tribulation period is for the Jewish people, and Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians tells us that we will be called away. We will be called away. The idea here is this. There's one hellish week yet to come for the Jewish people. It's a seven-year period we call the tribulation period. And there's only a certain group of people that will be exempt. Who are they? People who truly believe, put their faith in Jesus as their Savior, we will be called out maybe this afternoon. Anytime soon. Could be this year, this month. Could be five years from now. But we're in closing times. Because why? Israel is now back in the land. And all these other prophecies are now starting to come into place. Make sure you know Jesus as your Savior. And then look forward to what's coming. Because we'll be gone. And that's good. All right. So how can we know the Bible is trustworthy? That it is what it says it is. The Bible claims to be inspired by the creator of the universe. And the exactness of the prophecies of the coming of the Son of the Woman, the Messiah, are so exact and so specific and so fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, you can know your Bible is inspired by the creator of of the universe. You don't need to waste your time looking to see what SETI will find out next. We already have a message from beyond earth. So what are you going to do with it? Make sure you keep it dusted off every Christmas, okay? Or will we spend time studying it? Spend time, and you need help. I had to go to seminary. It took me nine years to get through that, believe it or not. I'm a fast student. And, uh, um, and, and it takes a long time to get it understood, so you need help from other people. And a good study Bible will help you there too. So make sure you have those tools and get into groups and study it out because it's a message from beyond earth. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Everybody here, maybe almost everybody here knew this beforehand that 
the Bible was inspired, but maybe they did not really understand it to the level. How well you've authenticated your word so that if anybody really wants to know, and most people don't, they don't want to know that the Bible's true because that means we're sinners. It cramps our style. But for those who do, the evidence is overwhelming. Lord, help us remember Peter's words. We do well to pay attention to it. Father, make us people of your word, we pray. And Lord, there's probably people in this room who need to be reminded of this. And maybe this day, I challenge everyone in this room to rethink how you handle the Scriptures from this day forth. You do well to pay attention to it. Father, we pray that you would help us do that and spend time in your Scriptures and be able to stand with our hands high and say, no, the Bible is true. It proves itself, whether you believe it or not. Oh, Lord, and then may we have our heads high looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ at any moment. Finally, Father, if there's someone here who does not know about their salvation, I pray they get that solved today about putting their faith in Jesus who died for our sins, the Messiah who was cut off for us to bring us to heaven into a relationship with him. Father, I pray everybody knows him before they leave today. And then, Lord, come back anytime. We're ready. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Study Bibles out there for you are available for you to buy, so I hope that you'll pick one up if you don't have one. And uh, next week, I will begin a new series. We're going to go into the Old Testament. We haven't done that for a while. We're going to study the life of Elijah. We'll be in there about eight weeks or so with him and the things that God did through him. And so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to enjoy that. So let's stand and be dismissed in, in song. Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that you'll call us. God bless you. And again, thanks.